This is Jared Lakefield, a novel by Don Fensler, Part 35, Phase 2, Part 6, The Regular Season. A couple days later, Jared Lakefield told me that Timothy Mannion was also very important in Jared's plans. I put all this in multiple fucking quotations as I had no idea what the fuck he meant. I knew he had pulled Timothy out of a wheelchair, but I don't know what this plans was beyond that, even though I'll admit that's pretty big, pulling a guy out of a wheelchair that, that can't walk. I was both frustrated on the one hand and even more in awe on the other concerning that man, or whatever he was, this guy, person, Jared Lakefield. I had come to see Jared as a combination basketball superstar and faith healer, a combination Michael Jordan and Benny Hinn and Jesus Christ and Buddha. A fucking weird combination to be sure, but that was all I could fathom at the moment. A guy who takes over both ends of the court and heals cripples in his spare time. What the fuck? Today is November 4th, and the Clippers are playing their first game of the regular season. My wife is already is ready to leave me because Jennifer hates San Diego. She hates California. She hates the NBA, and especially she hates not knowing what the hell is going to happen to us. I know Jennifer will not really leave me, but she is making sure I understand her frustration and confusion. God damn it, life can be painful at times. Not to be a whiny Aunt Agnes, but sometimes there is just no fucking letting up. Nothing you can do to stop the fucking stress and worry and t tendency to want to cut your throat sideways with a bandsaw. The weather is nice in San Diego. It is always nice in San Diego. For some fucking reason, that makes everything worse. I see Jared out on the court warming up. He is going through his usual silly ghost man routine of pretending like he is in a game. A phantom covers him. He moves to the left, to the right. He faked out the phantom and takes a shot, and the shot goes in. Jared was still in his own world. Right now, he looked exactly like the player I knew at St. Cloud. In his own world and supremely confident. I was feeling a little better, a little more at ease. So it gave me a few seconds of spite from my despair to see him following his usual routine, even though his clapper teammates seemed to be fucking amused by it. I felt a sudden wave of anger, like you motherfuckers don't know what you have here in Jared Lakefield. I resented deeply anyone who laughed or slighted Jared Lakefield. But as usual, Jared was oblivious or just didn't seem to fucking care or even notice that he was being watched and laughed at. The other clapper players finally began shooting casually. You could tell by their body language they knew they were just the fucking lowly laughing stop stock of the NBA and the entire Milky Way, the, the San Diego clappers. They knew they were the clappers, never having done anything, going nowhere, but for all fucking eternity and back to the fucking beginning of time. Even Moses, the Queen of Sheba, and Nebuchadnezzar himself in all his glory despised the clappers, the, cla the players in a great injustice to life on earth as we know it, were millionaires, the bastards, but they were the clappers, about as low as you can get outside the state of Oklahoma. The opponent was the Memphis Bears, a fine team. They had one of the biggest fucking jerks ever on the team, Zeke Rudolph, a man with incredible talents but an evil heart. The Clappers had no chance against Rudolph and the Bears. The game started with Jared Lakefield on the bench, no surprise. This did not seem to bother him. He watched passively as Memphis began to to do the as anticipated dismantling of the clappers. It was 35 to 20 just after one quarter. It was just a game, it was just a game, it was just a game already out of control. Zeke Rudolph had his way with the hapless clappers with dunks, short jumpers, and it seemed like he took down every re rebound. Memphis slowed down in the second quarter, but not much. much. 
Unfortunately, the Clappers also slowed down. At half, the score was 65 to 34. It was men against boys, or Superman against three year old fucking babies. Zeke R was having a ball. The fucking. Zeke, uh, Zeke Rudolph was having a ball. The fucking time of his life. The fucking grin on his face out there irked me to no fucking end. It was a clear case of the triumph of, of evil over ridiculous, of the pure evil uh, bears having its way with the stupid, weak clappers. I was in despair again. I knew there was no way they were going to put in Jared Lakefield. No way our coach would put him in. My overwhelming despair and what the fuck feeling came back, roaring like an avalanche on Mount McKinley. I looked at Jared on the bench and felt nothing. Absolutely fucking nothing. And this was Jared Lakefield. Why would I feel nothing? I didn't know what was happening. Jennifer, Jennifer and I were watching the game from midcourt about 50 feet up. I have never felt worse in my life, more scared. What had I done? What had I done bringing us out here? We didn't belong here, Jennifer and I. No matter how much Jared paid me to be his reporter, it wasn't, or whatever he fucking called it, it wasn't worth it. Was I supposed to write about how nice he looked sitting on the bench, about his calm eyes and passive air and every hair in place, like a choir boy in church? I walked with the team into the locker room. The coach was livid. The clapper coach was livid. He was a hot-tempered guy named, ironically, Darren Champion. A champion coaching the San Diego Clippers, Clappers. He said the players weren't playing defense. They weren't moving on fucking offense. They weren't fucking screening. They weren't fucking rebounded. At least he knew how to fucking speak English. Fucking good English. Even though what he said was so fucking obvious. And everything he said was absolutely fucking right. Though my Aunt Agnes and her baby Billy Bob could have figured that out. Except for Darren chanting rant. Darren Champion ranting, there was no sound. There was no response from the players at all. I couldn't tell if the players were listening or not. Jared was listening. Then he did something very strange. He raised his hand. Like a third grader in school, he raised his hand. What the fucking hell do you want, spewed Champion? They are not covering us at all on shots outside of 15 feet, said Jared. We are wide open, but we are not taking the shots, and when we do, we miss them. Coach Champion was clearly taken aback. Impressed even not by Jared's words, but by his aura and the power of Jared's delivery. I gulped, wondering what was going to happen next. So what is your goddamn fucking pr proposal, Lakeman? Bella Champion. Jared Lakeman did not answer. There was a long, awkward silence. It was silence. It was a silence that Jared Lakefield was winning. It is the silence that Jared always wins, and I knew something was about to happen. Darren Champion, clearly uncomfortable, asked, so what are you, what is your fucking proposal, Coach Lakeman? Lakeman. Champion was not finished. Say something right now or shut the fuck up or I'll send you back to fucking Topeka, fucking Nebraska. Or are you guys going to shoot, or are you guys going to, or are you the guy, or are you the guy who is going to start shooting from outside? Champion was still trying to be tough, but his voice cracked like a 13-year-old asking the prom queen for a date. Fucking Topeka, fucking Nebraska. I could tell that Coach Champion had come under the spell of Jared Lakefield at this very moment. Jared looked at him with the eyes that burn holes through steel. Yes, he said, I will make those shots. And we will win. We will win. 
There was a silence, not of disbelief. It was way beyond fucking disbelief. The score was 69 to 35. Our voices were silent. Our jaws were scraping the fucking floor. None of us in that locker room could speak or react. That's the end of part 36.